Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. And so today I'd like to speak a little bit about missions, and I'm calling this Missions from Cover to Cover, Genesis to Revelation. And you're thinking that all my past sermons were long, you can only imagine what this one might be like. Well, I've worked hard to take out all the other stuff and to really hone in on what the Bible would have to say a little bit about missions. I read about a story where a deacon was briefed as they were getting ready to go into a a missions banquet and the leadership told the deacons that you need to be very careful because in our midst are a lot of foreign people that don't understand the American culture. So you don't want to do anything that might offend them, so try to connect with them. So during the banquet, a deacon happened to sit next to a man from Africa. And so he was watching this man from Africa enjoy the chicken that he had. He was just really just enjoying that chicken. So the deacon leaned over and didn't know really how to communicate well with his African new friend he was trying to make. And so he said, hmm, chomp, chomp, good, hmm? And the other guy kind of looked at him and said, good, hmm, yeah. So a little bit later, he watched his African friend take this delicious hot coffee and drink and savor that coffee. So the deacon looked at him and said, glug, glug, good, huh? And the guy was kind of quizzing him, looked back and kind of figured out what was going on. And he said, hmm, good. Well, a few minutes later, the deacon was just horribly embarrassed because they introduced the speaker for the missionary banquet. And this African man walked up to the platform and he gave the most articulate flawless message, even with a little bit of Oxford accent in it. And so now you can imagine the deacon is wondering just what he did to this guy. And so this African missionary came back to the table and as he did, he looked at the deacon and he said, blah, 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 good, huh? (laughs) You know, now we're laughing at that because some of us might have been in a situation where we got embarrassed. Who hasn't? It'll happen to us sometime or another. I also heard of another story where that some American families invited a foreign guest to stay with them and as they were, you know, fellowshipping afterwards, the American hostess brought this person a hot cup of tea. And so they brought him the hot water and the tea bag. And so this foreigner took the bag, ripped open the tea bag and poured the tea leaves inside. And so the hostess quickly said, no, 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 no. What we do is we actually put the bag in the cup like that. And so this foreigner kind of said, oh, okay, you know, didn't want to offend anybody. So a few moments later, the American host has handed the foreigner this little packet of sweet and low. So then this foreigner took the sweet and low and chucked that right into the cup, bag and all. Well, I can tell you that we've all done that. We're now heading to Myanmar and then on into Singapore. I know a little bit about the Singaporean culture, but I don't know anything about Myanmar at all. And Carol and I are very nervous. We don't want to make a faux pas, especially when we want to communicate the message. So we don't want to put up any barriers that might be there. Well, some of you, you might feel uncomfortable because I use the word mission. Some of you get very nervous because in your mind, it it just conjures up all sorts of images of what a missionary is, whether they eat bugs and bushes and roots and they live in huts in some area, and some do. And they really want to do that to reach people that are unreached, even have to learn their language and their culture. And so some of you might be a little nervous. And what I'd like to do is to take you on a brief but a powerful journey on what the Bible might say about missions and what it is and what it's not. And I want to explain to you a little bit about God's thoughts on missions and His vision for the world as well as our response and what it could and should be to that. So first of all, let me begin answering a a question here that might be what is missions, what it is not, and what it is. So first of all, missions is not evangelism. Now, I know some of you might grab a nitroglycerin tablet now when you hear me say that because you think of missions as evangelism. Yes, evangelism will take place on missions, but sometimes it's not always about passing out tracts or standing in a pulpit or giving the gospel to some tribal chief. There are a lot of things that go around the concept of missions, and evangelism is a part of it. But that's not all what it is. But what is it, then, if it's not you know, evangelism, then what would it be? Well, actually, missions is a little bit more than that. And if you look there at that little outline I put for you, let me read it to you so you can have it. I think it'll help you. Missions is reaching people who you normally wouldn't or couldn't reach in the normal church ministries. People that you wouldn't or couldn't reach in the normal church ministries. Now, as I did this study, I came up with a lot of people who've studied the Bible and studied missionology for a long time. 
And they wanted us to get a more clear picture of what missions might be and maybe two illustrations that might help you to go a little bit beyond what we're doing. Anytime we reach people for Christ, that is an outreach, it is evangelism, but missions is a little bit more. For example, we cannot effectively do missions in Iraq right now, leave in the morning, do our missions, and be back by this evening so we can go to work tomorrow. The distance will keep us from doing that. And that's why there are people that are called to go to a land location that is much further than where we are and to settle there, whether it's for a few days, weeks, months, years, or a lifetime. But there's also another thing. Let's just say we don't leave the island. There are people groups on our island that speak Japanese or Vietnamese, and they're beyond our culture a little bit, although it's somewhat Asian, but they certainly are beyond our language ability, so we don't communicate in their language. And so it would require someone who would learn their culture, knows their language, to be able to reach them. So we don't have to merely go around the world. We can just go a couple blocks away. And that would be doing missions. And of course, it could be beyond that too. It could be a style of missions, whether it's working with children or senior adults or homeless people, but it's taking it beyond where we are. And so what I'd like to do is to kind of tell you a little bit more about what a kind of a God we have and what he thinks about missions and maybe how he projected it in scripture. So here's number one for you. We serve what I would like to call a mission active God. In other words, mission isn't just something part of his heart. He absolutely, in his divine sovereignty, orchestrates mankind in a way to accomplish his mission or evangelistic goals. And so let's look at that for just a moment since it's such a high part, a priority in his life. If that was to take you into the Bible, we would go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Now we know Adam and Eve at one time, they did not need to be evangelized because they were living a life of innocence before God. But then when they fell, they fell very swiftly and very hard and they fell eternally. Well, I believe according to the New Testament that the plan of salvation was already in the mind of God before he launched it knowing that man would fall. And that when he did, he communicated that in Genesis chapter 3, as you can well see that in front of you. Let me read it to you. It says this, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, as it was spoken now. And you shall bruise your head, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel, speaking to Satan. So basically what's saying is simply this. Even though mankind has fallen, and Satan is the culprit behind all of that, that there would be tension for a long time between Satan and mankind and God, but that God would provide in the future a way to end that conflict. So right then we're beginning to see the first beat of God's heart towards missions. But as we move away from that, then we quickly have to move into the Jewish nation. You would think that when man fell, and God even spoke about that in Genesis chapter 3, that man would kind of get a wake-up call, but he didn't. Man got so bad that he had to basically destroy mankind and the earth through this flood, leave a few alive, and start over again. And then you would think you would see a great revival and people following God, only to find them coming together in the Tower of Babel, and it was so bad. So then God looks at mankind because now the second beat of his heart, for those who do not know Christ, is he said, I still want to redeem them. So what he does now is he selects a person by the name of Abraham. And then he puts together the Jewish nation, Jewish race. And he says, all right, through Abraham and the Jews, I'm going to carve out a group of people. And through that group, I'm going to send the Messiah. But more than that, it's through that group also. We're going to then see all the people of the world to be blessed. Because you would think that maybe God would say, mankind is so bad, so fooey with the rest of mankind. I'm just going to take my own little group over here known as Jews, and we're going to just do it all with them. He didn't even do that. Let's look at the passage I have there for you. A passage we can spend days on. It's such a very pivotal passage in Scripture. Found again in Scripture, Genesis. Look at it as it says this. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your people, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I'll show you. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and will curse him who curses you. And here's the part I like. Look at it. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. If you have a pen and you'd like to mark that in your Bible, as important as that is, I'd like you to circle the word all, that all the families. So it wasn't just going to rest upon a small group of people, but that he would then do something with the Jewish nation so that they too could be used in a mighty way to promote the Lord Jehovah. 
that they could be saved. So if we went a little bit further, you would find that he carved out of this nation and he gave them laws and he gave them principles to live by and he did mighty works to show himself strong upon the Jews, to show them in such a way as becoming attractive to those that were on the outside of the faith, made them a a, a kingdom of priests, so to speak made him such a wonderful group. And then in Psalm 67, he unleashed the Jews again, reminding them to go out and to be able to tell others about Jehovah. So now we go back to the garden, and we see the garden, in the garden, God began his little trip on being a mission active God. And then he stepped it up with the Jewish people through Abraham. But even then, as you would look at them being an attractive nation and being given this message to be able to go to all nations and explain that message of the coming Messiah, that you would think people would flock. Not only did other nations, by far the majority, never came to Christ. I didn't say no one came, but by far the majority never came to Christ. It seemed like the Jewish nation themselves imploded. And everything that God had for them, they, did, they decided to reject God. You know, folks, I try to read through the Bible in a year, and I'm right now in the, the book of Ezekiel. And I've just come off of some of these other prophets. It is, to me, sometimes the most depressing books in the Bible when it talks about these wonderfully gifted people that had so much a connectivity with God that they would turn their back on God and how God then speaks to them. But again, God says, I'm not wiping my hands of the human race. We're still going to go at it a little bit more. So now we move toward the New Testament. We know that Jesus Christ died on the cross, made the payment for sin. He now did what he said he was going to do, proving that he was God, rising from the dead, and then saying, all you had to do is to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. So Jesus Christ not only became the missionary, he was the one that was also the message. So when you hear evangelism, what is it? It's from a word that means evangel, and the evangel is Jesus Christ. So he is the message and the messenger. But he says, but that's not enough. I still have a missionary's heart, God says. So now he speaks through Christ to a group of people that is passed down to us. But here's the historical setting. Jesus died. He rose again from the dead, but he had not yet ascended into heaven. And so after he died and he rose again, he is now speaking to a select group of people. And one more time, we're able to perhaps exercise his heart and be able to hear his heart beating. For those who don't know Christ, we're able to see a missionary heart in the heart of God. And look at it, if you will, for just a moment here in the book of Acts as you see how important this is. It says this in Acts chapter 1. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked the Lord, saying, Lord... Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Remember how bad Israel was? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But now he speaks to them and he says, But you, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth and to the end of the earth. So what he's done now is he says, Now you Christians, you are to reach the world for Christ. It started in the garden, it moved to the Jewish nation, and now he's given it to us. And so what happens now, we who are Jews and Gentiles who come to faith in Christ, we now turn our sights to everyone, whatever ethnic group they might be. So then as you continue to read through the book of Acts, you're going to find that those three areas, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world, even Jerusalem as a city, you will see that those areas were reached until you got to the phrase, unto the outermost parts of the earth, or unto the end of the earth. When you read Acts chapter 28, you're going to find, where is Paul then? Paul's in Rome. To them, that would have been perhaps the end of the earth. They didn't know about Latin America, the United States, or America, let alone Honolulu, or Oahu, or Nuuanu at that time. But God had already created the world. There were people groups all over the world that still hadn't heard about Christ. And so God's desire is that we now, who are left in this generation, this generation known as grace, to communicate that same heartbeat of God for missions to be able to reach them for Jesus Christ. Can you imagine how God is smiling upon those people who responded to the prompting of the Spirit to be willing to come here to help us? How that God is smiling on those that felt prompted of the Spirit then to go to Missouri to help CEF as we're doing today. And how that God is still working within us to do that same particular message. How that we too need to follow that. So as I look at this, I want to reach this area for Christ. How is that going to happen? Well, let me just clarify this. This message of the gospel will go to all people groups. Now, he will do it perhaps a little bit later than just in our generation. In fact, that great commission will be fulfilled. If you knew your Bible and now we're at Revelation, can you imagine we went from Genesis to Revelation that fast? 
So now we're in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 7, good quality Bible scholars will tell you that it is now describing a period of time that is most likely during the tribulation. It's during the time where all believers are taken off the earth, but there are still witnesses that are here communicating the message of the gospel. And those people, groups that have not been yet reached, will be reached even during the tribulation, that there will be people out of every people group, tongue and, 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 and tribe, will know Christ as Savior. So God says, I'm not going to leave anyone out of my family who could be in my family, who should be in my family. And those that are left out are those who God in His foreknowledge didn't choose, but knew would not trust Christ as her Savior. And so no one would be left out. And that's the kind of God that we have. And we want to partner with Him on that. And I, I hope we would. Look over here at Revelation chapter 7. A great encouragement for those that are out there wanting to do missions. It says, And after these things I looked and I beheld a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations. Circle the word all. You could almost draw a line all the way back to Genesis when it said through all uh, through the Jews, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So there will be people groups that will be in heaven, worshiping God out of all different tribes. And that's what gets me excited, because now I have to say, what would be my response? If missions is such a high priority to God, then should missions be a high priority to people like you and me? And I believe it should be our highest priority. Now let me pause for a moment and give you a bit of a parenthesis. Some of you are hearing this and you're saying, no, I think our highest priority, if I take it back to the Westminster Catechism, is that we would all glorify the Lord, that we should love Him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and He receives all the glory and the praise. Do you know, I cannot refute that at all. I really believe that that would be the case. But in order for us to get to that level where people are authentically, genuinely worshiping God, God's way, and the right God, the only way they can do that is if they become one of His children by faith. And so our job now is to bring them to a point of salvation. Now listen carefully to what I'm about to say. I want to change the paradigm a little bit in the minds of people that think that I'm going to go out to win people so they don't go to hell, period, end of subject, let's go to the next point. No, my responsibility is true to give them the gospel. I do not want them to go to that horrible real place called hell under the condemnation of God for all eternity. But I don't only want them not to go there. I don't want to just have fire insurance. I want them to come to experience what it means to truly worship God with a pure and clean heart for Him. That's what God is smiling about. So to get them there, though, I do need to do evangelism. So that brings us to our next point now. So who's supposed to be involved in this? Well, as a church, mission should be our highest priority as well. If it is with God, and I'm going to be God-like, then I should have the same vision for that as well. Up on your screen, I'm going to show you a baseball diamond, all right? If you can see that, I have a pointer because I want to show you some things. I don't know if you can see it very well. What I'm going to describe for you right now is an illustration of some biblical truths that um, the illustration has come along and many, many churches use it because we can visualize it a little bit better. The biblical truths have been around since the Bible days. We've been taught that in seminary and Bible college, those that have been able to go to that, and so have you as well. Now, I'd like to show you, though, that sometimes churches now that are entering into the concept of missions, they make missions to be like a base in this baseball diamond, all right? Or they'll say it's a compartment of what we do. We have worship, we have children, we have youth, we have Bible studies, we maybe do some stuff outside, and then we also have missions where we go outside of our church and do things. So it becomes kind of like a, if you don't mind me using this term, a strip center. You have this store here, this store here, this store here, this store here, and they're all competing against each other. Listen carefully. That's not how the Bible teaches it. In fact, a better illustration might be more like Disney World or Disneyland. Oh, you've got Tomorrowland and Futureland or whatever and Frontierland and I don't know all these different, I don't go there, but you've got these different places and you think, well, yeah, they're all different. Yeah, they are. But the difference between that and a strip center is Disney World, it's all about the mouse. Do you know what I mean? They're not in competition with one another. They're all doing this so that they can make the mouse world known. So we might have different areas, but it's all about Jesus Christ. Now let me show it to you again on this baseball diamond. So to help you, there are compartments. So it's not just only missions and we don't do worship and we don't do Bible teaching. We don't do fellowship. We have to do that too, but I want to show it to you. So watch carefully. 
All right, you have first base over here. This would be for people that would say, let's get started. We're here at home plate. We don't stay there. We're trying to get to first base. So we get to first base, and that's about fellowship. That's about making sure you feel like you can be a part of the family of God. You might trust Christ as Savior. Get involved in the life of the church. A little bit of assimilation going on to see who you are and whose you are so you can be a part of the fellowship. But it's not all about fellowship. It's not all about coffee and tea and eating and, and parties and picnics and barbecues. That's only a part of it. It is important. It is a base. You can't get to second base unless you've been to first base. Now, once you're doing that, you do go to second base. So now you're saying, okay, it's more than fellowship. I need to know the word. I need to know it correctly. I need to know it accurately. I need to know how I'd apply it to my life. So a better term would be spiritual maturity comes from abiding in God's word. So we could talk about Bible study. So is it all about Bible study and Sunday school and small groups? No, it's not. You can't get to third base unless you go to second base, but you can't get to home plate unless you go to third base. So third base might be, okay, I'm around God's people. I have a sense of believing and belonging. Now I'm learning how to become like Christ. But now how can I help others? So third base might be more ministry leadership, equipping you to go and use your giftedness to help touch other lives locally and begin giving a burden for those that are beyond our people group here. So now we have third base, which is a very important base. But I need to tell you, though, it's not about third base. I can go to first base and lose the ball game. I can go to second and third base and lose the ball game. The whole goal is to take the runner around the bases, and here's where I'm going. It's to get them home for a home run. And here we could talk about missions. So is it all about this? No. Is it a compartment of this? In a way. But it's bringing people to the full scope that we want them to do missions. So far, I've been to this church four and a half years. We've did a lot with fellowship. We're ramping that up. We're doing some outreach events. We've really worked hard at spiritual life development, and I can give you some ideas that we're working there. Can we improve on any of these? Absolutely. Are we doing some ministry leadership development? We're trying to work towards that. But now we're really ramping up to help people to realize that God has gifted you to do mission work somewhere along the way that you would partner with God in doing missions. Now, Worship is where the baseball is in the center, in the sense because the pitcher is the one who controls the entire game. So really, it's getting the person to home plate. So the game is about hitting a home run here, mission. So it is getting you around. It is a base. It's not the only base, but it's getting people to see the importance of missions. Now, let me go one more step. When the runner comes across and he makes that, 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 that run, he hits home plate, everybody runs out of the dugout and they're all clapping and celebrating. Technically, we might be celebrating the fact that that guy made a run. But I'd like to say that we would celebrate, not only did he make a run, but we're celebrating everyone who helped out. Now, you like this illustration. Most people do. I think you do. But let me tell you one flaw with this illustration. You don't leave this base in a real-life Christian life church ministry paradigm. You come here, you do your fellowship, but you kind of like take first base with you to second base because you're still fellowshipping while you're Bible studying, studying your Bible. All right? But you don't just leave Bible study to now to lead a ministry so you quit reading your Bible and studying. No, you bring second base with you. And then when you go to home plate, you're kind of really grabbing first base, second base, third base, and you're bringing it with you. Are you all with me? Say, uh-huh. Okay. Now, that's just a little bit of a diamond effect for you to see that we're about missions. Now, if you will, I'd like to speak to our young people for a moment. I don't know yet if you could answer, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Most of you don't have an answer as far as a career. That is not wrong for you to say that. You're at a stage in your life where you're putting all the tools in your toolbox to be what God wants you to be, hopefully, and to know, to be prepared to add value to society for God in some measure. As your pastor and one who I, I hope I'm representing God at this stage, I believe I am, I'm going to ask you young people, and you define where you are as young, and just say to the Lord, Lord, do you want me to consider missions as a career move for me instead of immediately thinking i go to school to become a butcher baker candlestick maker at least ask the lord throw it into the pot lord would you possibly be calling me into missions and i'm gonna just leave you with that sincerely go to the lord humbly ask him because you want to please him if he wants you in missions you don't want to be jonah in the boat when you should have been in nineveh and you're in some other boat okay now i'm not going to say that every kid has got to go into missions all I am saying is we all need to say, where are we going? Now, let me talk to you that are already in your particular profession. There's two things that I could speak to that. If you're in your profession in life, their question will be, 
is, am I fully satisfied? Am I really experiencing all from my profession, my job, what I'm doing right now, my employment? Is God possibly starting to maybe uh, stir up my, 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 my employment nest? And maybe God is wanting me to say, wait a minute, I felt so empty in my career for so long. Maybe I need to go to the Lord and say, Lord, do you want me to transition in my life? I don't know how to do this. It's so scary. But, but Lord, do you want me to do this? At least humbly ask God that. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.